good morning and welcome, welcome, welcome. It is a joy to see you all this morning. And for those that are joining online, welcome too. Uh, so excited this morning we get to introduce a new song to you. And it's a song of celebrating. And we're celebrating God's love. And that no matter what, God is for us. How exciting is that? That every day we wake up, we know that God is for us. Yay hoo, right? <laughs> yes. Yes, so this song is called God is For Us, and it's all about the Father's love. And so we're, we're just excited to bring this to you today and uh, let you learn this song with us as well. So let's sing it together. amazing, beautiful, and brilliant. And you know, we don't know what's going to happen the rest of this day. We have a good idea. I mean, we have no idea what really is going to happen tomorrow. We can look to the future, and we can fear and worry, or we can we look to the future with hope. And I want to share this verse. This is a beautiful verse from Isaiah. It says to you, For I am the Lord your God, who upholds your right hand. I am the Lord your God who holds your hand and who says to you, listen, he's saying this to you, do not fear, I will help you. I will help you. We don't know what holds tomorrow, but we do know who will hold our hand tomorrow. 
And let us rest in that and worship in that with a song with I Know Who Holds Tomorrow. I don't know about tomorrow, I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. Father God, we thank you that no matter where we're at, no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in, no matter what emotion we're experiencing, you are holding our hand. We thank you for all our days that you will walk with us and that we have no need to fear because your presence is with us. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Today is our monthly potluck. Last night we were doing a sound check, making sure everything was working, and I I read a passage of scripture in that video and shared it on Facebook Live. Has anybody here had the misfortune of watching that yet? Laura has. I'm surprised you're here this morning after watching that one. If you're bored and you want to see me at my not best, then go on and watch that from last night. Because I read a passage, I mean, you know what, I'm not going to run it for you. Go on and watch it, okay? But... Today is a potluck, so I am excited about this because it has been several months since we've had potluck, and I love your food, so I'm hoping you guys can stick around. It'll be right after service. We should start, I don't know, 11.30, 11.40, somewhere around in there. We're going to have some time to visit. We'll kick it around some, but I hope you guys can stay. We want you guys to as much as you can. A few things also that's there to be aware of for the ladies' luncheon. That's this coming Tuesday. You guys need to be aware of that one, and then next Sunday is our Biker Sunday. So it's going to kind of be a break here from our Revelation series. We're going to jump in next Sunday, Biker Sunday. Uh, we've been inviting bikers to come. We'll see how many show up. 
We're praying for 50. That'd be a fantastic, be phenomenal if we had 50. We'll see how many actually come. But if you can, leave the north side of the street out here on the north side of the church. Leave that open. So if you normally park on the north side of the street, we're asking that you leave that open so the bikers can come in and park there. And I don't know how many are going to come. We just don't know. But we're praying for a few at least. And so if you guys can help us with that, that'd be great. Just praying in that end. After the service, the bikers are going to be heading up. Rob, where, where are you guys going? To, I don't remember the name. To the buffet of that way. So, to Belgrade? Okay, going up to Belgrade. So, they're driving up to Belgrade. If any of you guys want to tag along, I'm going to be tracking along in my Suburban afterwards. We've got a few people riding with us. So, if anybody you guys want to ride along and just follow along in your vehicle and have lunch with them, you're more than welcome to do so. We're going up to Belgrade, wherever that is. I know it's that way. So, it's that way. For those on, who are watching us live right now, you don't know what way that way is. That way's north. So just drive north, apparently. Over by Fullerton. Over by Fullerton. Okay. And Fullerton has a really good gun shop, so that's even more motivation to go that way. So it's closed on Sundays, my wife reminds me. Okay. Very smugly. You can still see it. We can drive by, get a picture taken in front of it. All right. It'll be fun. Okay. Awana begins here in two weeks. We had registration last Wednesday. Honestly, I wasn't expecting anybody really to show up, and I don't know how many we actually had come through. Um, there weren't a lot, but we kind of expected that. We'll see what happens as the year progresses. So do pray for our WANA program. It's going to kick off in just a couple weeks. So pray for that. Pray for kids. We'll see where God takes us this year with that. Um, Sunday, August 30, be aware of the fact we have a hymn sing that night, that afternoon at 4. So Dennis wants us all to come, right, Dennis? You want us all to come? Him saying that Sunday afternoon at four, we're having a missionary going to be here that morning. She's going to be presenting after the service. We're going to have a regular scheduled service, and then we would like, and this is for everybody, okay? So your whole family, and we want kids to be exposed to this too. She's going to take about 20 minutes, somewhere around in there, and she's going to present on her ministry following the service, all right? So there'll be a little bit of a break there, time to get a drink and use the restroom, stuff like that, and come back together. But if you can, stick around and just hear about her ministry afterwards. And then there'll be a lunch at the sweet shop. Every family is responsible for their own costs there. We're going to be going to the sweet shop if you have any questions on that too. But that'll be on August 30 as well. A couple prayer things to be aware of. Junior, um, Junior Riesland, he had his throat stretched this last week. But then he also has another procedure coming up on Wednesday. So pray for Junior as he has these things happening. Last night, Jeremy Paws, is that right? Is that his name? Jeremy Paws lost his shop over by the Elba area. He had a grill that, from what I understand, exploded on him, and so the fire department was called in. There was no lives lost, but that was a pretty big deal, so pray for the Paws family in that one. This last week, many of you are aware of the Day Road Show that went through Iowa, right? We joke about my kids about a hurricane inland. We're, we're okay. Apparently, we're not really okay from these hurricanes, all right? Next year, I'm hoping for a Sharknado because I guess these things can happen, but the Road Show went through Iowa. It was within five miles of my sister's farm. They actually had some crops that were twisted up, they said, but everything looks like it's going to be okay there. Um, but it was, yeah, the town five miles from them was out of power for 36 hours. Um, but it was, if you guys have a chance to see that, there's just a lot of prayers that need to go up as they're anticipating millions of acres of crop ground is just destroyed through this windstorm that happened. And so do pray for them. We had some friends that were working. They lived down south of Marshalltown where it got hit really hard. The father had called the wife and said, hey, look, there's the storm's coming. You guys get the animals in. They were doing it. Everything was calm. And the next minute, they had sheet metal flying off. One of the kids was cut by a piece of sheet metal flying in. He had four stitches. Um, but they're safe. They're doing okay. It was, could have been so much worse than what it was because it, it just came out of nowhere. It was just one of those storms. But I do continue to pray for the restoration there of, of the state of Iowa and all the damage that they had with those things as well. Then on the inside, you're going to see a couple things mentioned there under the prayer items. Katie Bradshaw is home, doing well. She's going to be in a brace for a little while yet, um, but from her four-wheeler accident, but she's doing really, really well. Um, our friend's baby there is also healing quickly. Um, that's a good thing. They had some pictures on Facebook. She's doing fantastic as well, so these are good praises. You'll notice a few things there regarding our facility. On the west side of the church here, there's a new sidewalk that's been poured. Our parking lot has been extended just a little bit, and our new sidewalk has been poured. Keith's kind of in charge of that, so that's happened. And you can go out there, take a look at that. Here in a couple weeks, we should be getting our new north doors that will be coming in. Our glass doors are coming in. We have scheduled the new sound system getting installed. That's going to happen here in the next couple weeks. 
And let's see, what else? Oh yes, and we're trying to get equipment purchased. Actually, it's already been here, it's already here. We're getting ready to set up for our, our closed circuit streaming down here in the classroom. So if we need overflow for, for anything major as we grow as a church, then those are things that we'll have, will be prepared and ready to roll. So there's a lot that's happening there. It's pretty important. One thing that's very important that I wanted you guys to be aware of is last week I mentioned Alvin and Sharon Weiss. They are our missionaries to Mexico. They have a Christian school down there. On the inside of the bulletin, you're going to see their little request there. Last week, we prayed that God would send students to them because right now, they don't have enough students to keep the school open. The problem is, is they can't close the school because of the required severance packages that they would have to pay to students, to the teachers, I'm sorry. So they can't afford to keep the school open because they don't have enough students. They can't afford to close the school because of the severance pay they'd have to pay by law. They're kind of stuck. And so they need some major prayers right now. Uh, so if you guys could pray for Alvin and Sharon, this Christian school they're trying to keep open, that is a very significant thing for them. And so we just need to keep them in prayer. It's, uh, they're just, they're, without God, they're stuck right now. And so we're just needing a miracle to happen there. So, oh yes, and Pat Hutchison, thank you, Rachel. Pat Hutchison, I went to see Pat on Friday. Pat Hutchison is having a heart procedure, a heart valve procedure this Thursday in Lincoln. So for those of you who know Pat Hutchison, continue to lift her up in prayer as well. She's having that heart valve procedure there Thursday morning early in Lincoln. So just keep her in prayer. All right. Well, let's go to prayer here. God, I thank you that you are big. We look at the problems in our lives, and sometimes all it takes is just a moment for us to sit back and reset and realize, okay, wait a minute. You're the God who created everything just by speaking. Why am I stressed about this? But Lord, the reality is sometimes life does get us down. And I'm praying for these, for these requests and the, and the situations in life that's happening. And I'm praying these people would, help, would, would, help, would be able to see you through all of this. That they'd be able to take a moment, as you say in Psalm 46, that just for a second, they would be able to be still and know that you are God. I pray for our missionaries, Alvin and Sharon, and just this position that they're in, this unattainable situation where, where really it's, it's a catch-22. Six one we have doesn't the other. They can't afford to stay open. They can't afford to close, and they don't know what they're going to do. And Lord, I pray that you would help them, that you would just give them direction, that you would provide for them, provide the needs they have. We pray for Junior and his procedure he's having on Wednesday. We ask you to be with him and the doctors, and for Pat as she goes in for this surgery on Thursday. It's it's not an open heart surgery. We praise you for that, but it is still an important procedure. And we ask that you'd be with her. We thank you for the healing you provided for the many people in our bulletin there, this prayer request. We thank you for watching over them. We praise you for that, God, just for, your, just for the power you have and for the things you continually do here at Grace, the improvements you make, those things like that, Lord, so that we can do a ministry. And Father, this, this year we're praying specifically for our WANA program, that you would work in that program, be with the volunteers who are coming and the kids who are coming. Lord, I pray that it be for your glory that we do this club this year. Be with our time today as a service. Help us, Lord, just to be able to learn something today from your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. I went over this last night. As I tend to do, I get excited, and I talk fast, and I'm going to try to keep it slow today. But that's not my nature. You're killing me. So let's get some tension out of the room here a little bit. Sievert, I went to see Sievert this week, and Sievert shared a story with me that I really appreciated. And I want to share it with you. A teacher was teaching her students about the sea creatures in the ocean. Talking about even the largest sea creatures, some of the whales and things like that. And she made a comment how like, some of the whales, they're, they're gentle giants and they're really not harmful to us as people because their throats are so small. For them, they can't swallow humans. And so from some of these creatures, we don't need to be scared of them because frankly, they can't do anything to us. And one of the students raised her hand and she said, well, according to the Bible, though, Jonah was swallowed by a, by a fish. Is, is that possible? Can a, can a fish swallow us? And the teacher said, well, little Susie, the problem is here, you can't always believe everything you read. And just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean it's actually true. And, and Susie, being the precocious child that she was, she said, but you know what? When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jonah if that really happened. And the teacher looked at her and kind of grinned a little bit, you know, like teachers do. And they say, well, what are you going to do if Jonah's not in heaven? And Susie looked at her and said, well, then you ask him. <laughs> I appreciated that. That was just, yeah, I don't know. 
Laughter helps us sometimes, right? I'm a little geared up this morning, so hopefully it'll help calm me down just a little bit as we talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly part two. Last week, we introduced these people, these characters out of Revelation chapter 11, 12, and 13. There are six characters we're going to be studying. Last week, we met the first two, the two witnesses. This week, we're going to talk about two more. Next, well, not next week, because next week's Biker Sunday. In two weeks, we're going to talk about the following two, hopefully. We'll see. But the good, the bad, and the ugly out of Revelation chapter 11, 12, and 13. It's a nice sermon here in our series on the end times. We've gone through a lot. We have a long way to go. Believe it or not, well, I, if you look in your, those of you who have been here, you understand that originally this was going to be a 10-week sermon series. Yeah, we didn't make that. We're not going to make it in 10 weeks. It's going to stretch out. It's going to be a good time. After we get done towards the end of Revelation here, as we get to the end of it, chapters 21 and 22, we're going to spend some time talking about heaven, what we know about heaven, what the Bible teaches about heaven. We're going to spend at least one week, maybe two or three, just on the topic of heaven. I'm excited about this. It's going to be fun. But today is not necessarily an exciting message. Today maybe should be an, well, a message that encourages us to, to warn our friends, to warn our neighbors, to warn those around us. But it's not necessarily an exciting message as we look at what Revelation has to say in the end times. Of course, understanding that the end times is this period leading up to the judgment day. So when we talk about it, it's an all-encompassing event, stretched over several years. It's not just a one event. This is stretched over several years, okay? And so this is the period leading up to the judgment day is what we're referring to when we talk about the end times. And today's message, we're going to be addressing this specifically, that every story has a bad guy. And today we're going to meet the bad guy of Revelation. He's mentioned in Revelation chapter 12 is where we see a lot talked about there with Satan. During this message, we're going to learn how Satan will be cast from heaven during the tribulation, how he will wage war against God's people, and how God will step in and protect them for his glory. This is a fascinating part. And it's I, I wish, I hope I get to see this, because as I read this chapter and I picture this as a movie in my mind, it's, it's a guy's movie in one chapter. So as we read through this, I want you guys to just kind of imagine this in your mind, imagine the events surrounding this and try to picture it. This is the film because hopefully someday God lets me watch this as he does some crazy things and we see some crazy things happen. All right, a little review. Last week we studied, we studied new characters introduced after both the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet, all right? So the sixth and the seventh trumpets were blown, but between the sixth and the seventh, we had two characters we looked at first, and those two characters were the two witnesses, we're going to talk about them. But we discussed as we introduced those, the six new characters there, we understood how all of them are going to be influential. In their own way, they're going to have an influence on their time during the tribulation, all right? So during the tribulation, they're going to have a very large influence, these six characters. So the first ones we looked at are the two witnesses. These were revealed before the seventh trumpet. All right, the two witnesses, their ministry is three and a half years long. God protects them supernaturally, keeps them alive until the day that finally God says their time is up, their ministry is done here, and he allows them to be killed. They're left in the streets three days, not, being, not allowed to be buried. The whole world rejoices. The Bible says they exchange gifts. They celebrate. It's like Christmas. It's like Christmas for the heathen, so to speak. And then after three and a half days, God resurrects them again, brings them back to life, and then he takes them to heaven with the whole world watching. I can just imagine what that would be like for the whole world to see that on CNN. How amazing that would be. How stunning that would be. That's the two witnesses. After the two witnesses, we had the seventh trumpet is blown, and then when these other characters are revealed, we have the woman who is Israel. She is Israel, and we'll talk about that why in just a moment. We have the dragon who is Satan. The red dragon, as he's described in Revelation 12, but the dragon who is Satan. We have the beast who is the Antichrist, Revelation chapter 13, and then the false prophet, also introduced in Revelation chapter 13. I'm going to try to get through the beast and the false prophet together in one week. I don't know if I'll be able to because there's a lot around them, okay? So I'm not going to force that one. If it takes two weeks, we'll take two weeks. But those are coming up. And there's a lot to talk about regarding the beast and the false prophet. But today we're going to talk about the woman and the dragon. But before we discuss these characters, last week during the Q&A, we had a question. The first question that was asked me during the Q&A, Pastor, what is sackcloth? The very first question. And if you remember, my brilliant answer was, I don't know. Brilliant, all right? What do you do? Well, here's the thing. We, in our English language, when we hear the word sackcloth, we think of material made from sack material, right? 
And so you see pictures, and it's always burlap. That's what you see. It's always burlap pictures. But I wasn't really content with that. I knew I threw that out there. I posited that last week as an option. But uh, So I did some reading this week. I did some studying, as I promised I would. And what is sackcloth? Now, there's, there's variances of answers, of course, out there. But the one that I really liked, who was supported by others, was it's, uh, on Got Questions. I like this website, gotquestions.org. It's a very conservative website. Great biblical answers. Gotquestions.org said it this way. They said, sackcloth and ashes were used in Old Testament times as a symbol of debasement, mourning, and or repentance. The sackcloth was a coarse material usually made of black goat's hair, making it quite uncomfortable to wear. The ashes signified desolation and ruin. Now, we understand that like a kid goat, their, their hair is very soft, but the coarse hair, the black hair is not. It is uncomfortable. And during the time of the Old Testament, they would wear sackcloth, and it was very obvious that this person was in mourning. Now, not that long ago in the 19th century here in the U.S., to wear burlap, what many of us associate as sackcloth, you, did, you, you wore that just because that's what you could afford to wear, right? You wore flower bags, and of course, the, the richer you were, the better the flower bags sometimes that you wore. But they wore sackcloth, not because they were in mourning, but because that's what they could afford. But in the Bible times, sackcloth, this goat's hair, was something that signified a very specific thing in their lives. It, it signified mourning. It signified they were not just poor, or they weren't poor, because the rich wore it as well. It wasn't a status that they were doing necessarily, a social status. It was where they were emotionally. It was something that you wore only when you were in mourning. And so these two witnesses are going to come to this earth, and they're going to be wearing sackcloth, what we believe is this black goat's hair material, signifying they're in mourning for what's about to come and what's happening on this world. That's what it's about. So when you understand sackcloth, I don't... I have a hard time grasping a lot of images out there, but I'm not exactly sure that the images I saw, in fact, I'm pretty certain the images I saw were not actually images of what sackcloth really looks like. I've got to do a little side here just for fun. I took a class when I was in Omaha on graphic design. I know. Graphic design, take away my man card, okay? It was my job. I had to take it. In that class, one of the guys was talking about a program, a flyer that a church was putting together. And in that flyer, they were going to put a picture of Jesus in that flyer, right? And so they sent it off to have it professionally done. And so when they sent the thing off, the, the graphic design company called them and said, we need, we need a picture of Jesus that you have. And so they sent in that famous painting that you see of Jesus. And they said, well, we don't want something somebody drew. Do you actually have a picture of Jesus? No, actually, I don't. Sackcloth is kind of the same way. There weren't exactly cameras back then, all right? We're guessing what it looked like. But this whole thing of the black goat's hair and stuff like that is a fairly educated guess of what, this, of what it actually looked like, okay? So when you see pictures, understand this is our impression. It's our drawing of what it is. All right, moving on. The characters. Who do we have represented? Characters of Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. It's a fun chapter to read. Revelation chapter 12 tells about some events that happened thousands of years prior, that happening then when John saw the vision, and that are yet to happen. Revelation chapter 12 is one of those chapters in Revelation where I've talked about in Revelation, things jump around a little bit. In Revelation chapter 12, there are things that jump around a little bit. We're going to talk about that here as we go into it, all right? The first thing we see, the first character we meet is the woman who represents Israel. Revelation chapter 12, we read these words, verse 1. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. John sees this woman. What's he see there in verse 2? She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains in the agony of giving birth. So here's this woman that John sees. Who is the woman? That's, of course, the question. Who's the woman? Well, let's see if we can't figure this out here just a little bit, looking at other scripture passages and trying to use a little bit of human logic that God has given us here. So the 12 stars, it's not just me, evangelical scholars, in, in every book that I read this week on my desk, and you go and look at my desk, there's a bunch of them, every one of them agreed that the 12 stars represent the 12 tribes. This woman represents Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what she, she does. She represents Israel, okay? And she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child is caught to God and to his throne. Now, this is the messianic reference. This is, this is a reference to Christ being born on this earth. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations. And some people look at this, well, this has to be Mary, right? This is, this is a reference to Mary. This isn't a reference to Israel. It's a reference to Mary. 
Well, I can see where you would go there, but the difference, the thing is, is that even Paul, in his writings, credits Israel, not Mary, with the birth of Christ. Okay, so we're going to go here to, to understanding this. The male child is a reference to Christ, whose birth is credited to Israel. And Paul, in Romans chapter 9, he tells very clearly here how it's out of Israel comes the Christ, comes the Messiah. He says this, they are Israelites. To them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. It's from Israel we get Christ. And so John, in his vision, he sees this woman, the 12 tribes, all right? He sees this woman who's pregnant, giving birth to the Christ. That's what he sees. That's what he knows. Now, here's what happens. We're going to jump just a few verses here. John sees this woman being protected by God. During the last half of the tribulation, John sees a, a supernatural protection coming down upon this woman. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, he sees this. The woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. Some say this event has already happened, but there's nowhere in history where we can see that God has supernaturally protected Israel for three and a half years. This is an event that's yet to happen. So we have Israel there who was, as John saw in vision, the woman very pregnant giving birth, which has already happened. The child has gone back to God. That's already happened. But then the woman flees into the wilderness. That has not yet happened. Not yet. Why is she fleeing in the wilderness? Because of the second character that we're about to see. All right. The second character we're going to read about here in Revelation chapter 12. So in verse 2, we read about the woman who was pregnant. She was in agony, about to give birth. And right away, John, in the very next verse, he sees this. He sees this vision about the red dragon, who is called Satan. And in his vision, in verse 3 of Revelation chapter 12, John writes these words. He says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. That would be quite the, little, quite the little sight, wouldn't it? Seven heads, ten horns, and on his heads, seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Can we think of a time during Christ's birth when there was a human character on this earth trying to kill off people that he thought might be the Messiah. King Herod gave an edict to kill all Hebrew children, Hebrew males, less than two, two years and under, as soon as he heard about the news of Christ's birth. When he heard it from the wise men, he wanted everyone killed. Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, is a reference to that one event happening. We can see how John and his visions and how history has proven over and over again God's prophecies are real. What God says is real. This is what John is seeing is that one event. Now, Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, Ezekiel 28, Revelation 12, all describe the fall of Satan prior to the fall of man. Okay? This is the fall of Satan. I'm going to back up just a second here. Look at this. Behold, a great red dragon, seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems. And what happens? His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. The stars of heaven is a reference to angels. When you read Ezekiel 28, these other passages in Isaiah, we understand that when Satan fell, he took a third of the angels with him. A third of the angels followed Satan. This passage right here talks about the fall of Satan, which happened prior to the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3. That's what we're looking at here, okay? Now, what we understand is that the seven heads, the ten horns, seven diadems, they indicate Satan's past and future political control. He's going to be very powerful here on this earth. And in Daniel chapter 7, if you read Daniel chapter 7, in time with, with Revelation chapter 12, you put those two together, it's a fascinating study. I'm going to be looking at this in just a couple of weeks because Daniel 7 describes in greater detail these diadems, these nations that Satan has ruled over in the past and will rule over in the future. And it's just a fascinating study. We're going to be looking at that again in a couple weeks. But in Daniel 7, we can see where it's talking about referencing these past governments that Satan has been in charge of and future governments that Satan will be in charge of. So understand that Satan is going to have a vast control here on this earth in times to come. Now, we talk about Satan's fall. Here, I found this fascinating. 
and, and I know it's to be true, but I want to share it with you anyway. Even though Satan fell before Adam and Eve's sin, Scripture seems to indicate even now Satan can still visit God's throne. And we get this from Revelation 12, but specifically we get it from Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. In Job 1 and 2, we're reading the story of Job, but we see an interesting dialogue between Satan and God. In Job chapter 1, verse 6, we see this. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. This is repeated almost word for word in Job 2, verse 1. Next verse. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. Satan was here on earth, but Satan has the ability to still be up in heaven visiting with God. He has the ability to be there. Satan's got it pretty good right now. He can have kind of the best of both worlds, so to speak. The problem is, is that's temporary. And just for a second, I want us to think about that. How many of us here on this earth think that right now we've got it pretty good? Or maybe we, we know people are kind of on both sides of the fence, so to speak. I think, okay, I'm going to do this for now, and then I'm going to walk on this side of the fence for a little while. And we think, yeah, we're kind of okay. Satan's there. He thinks he's kind of got it all right. The problem is, it's temporary. And someday, we, just like Satan, is going to answer, we're going to answer for this. Revelation 12 describes a time when Satan will be cast from heaven for good and will exert his anger upon the earth. There's a time this is coming. Revelation chapter 12, 7 and 8. War arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. Again, I told you that when, at the beginning of this, that when we read these verses, picture this. Try to picture this. Picture Michael and his angels on one side and Satan and his angels on the other and this great war happening. And at the end, Satan gets cast down from heaven. So what happens, he gets cast down from heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan. The deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth. His angels were thrown down with him. Satan is finally cast from heaven. I heard a loud voice saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. This is a reference to Job chapter 1, where Satan and God have this conversation about Job. And Satan says to God, God, Job's only a good person because you haven't tested him. He's accusing Job before God. It's exactly what John is saying here. He accuses them day and night before our God. And God finally says, enough, no more of you in my presence. They've conquered him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Job, in the end, conquered Satan because Job would not do what Satan accused him of doing. And so in the end, Satan lost that battle. Now, here's what's terrifying, this very next verse. Because this has real consequences for those on earth at this time. Revelation chapter 12, verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. At this point, Satan knows his time is coming to an end. He is no longer able to access heaven. He's been kicked out, him and his angels. He no longer can go up there. His time is short. When you know things aren't going your way, well, let me put it this way. I have a good friend of mine who, he's a strong Christian man. I love him. I respect him greatly. But when he's working on a car and things go south, you don't want to be around him because he becomes very unsanctified at that moment, right? Can we identify with this? When things aren't going our way, how easy it is for us to be the cheerful, pleasant, God-fearing Christians we should be at that moment? <laughs> right? Okay? So it just doesn't happen. Satan right now, he's never really God-fearing. And now we have a point where he's coming down to earth. Things aren't going his way. It's not going to end well. And he's angry. He's angry, and he's coming down to this earth. This, we believe, is going to happen in the last three and a half years of tribulation. The final three and a half years, we thought the first part was bad. The second part's going to be even worse, because now Satan himself, being confined on this earth, is about to be turned loose. In his anger, Satan's going to try to destroy all Israelites, God's people. He's tried this before. Not that long ago, if we think back to the 1940s, trying to exterminate all the Jews. And he's going to try it again. He's going to try to exterminate all of God's people. Because they gave birth to the Messiah, who ultimately defeated victory, who ultimately had victory over death. I'm sorry, who ultimately had victory over death. 
And Satan, in his anger, is going to try to kill the ones that God used for that. He's going to say, okay, God, that's your favorite toy. I'm going to break it. I grew up with three brothers. There were times that we did not get along always. I know that's hard to believe, but it's true. And so when your brother, when you're mad at your brother, what do you want to do? You want to hurt your brother. And if he's bigger than you, you can't actually hurt him, but maybe you can do something to something he owns, right? This is what Satan's trying to do. He's smaller than God, so he can't hurt God, but I'm going to take something away that God wants. And John describes this. When the dragon saw that he'd been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. God, this is your chosen people? Check this out. I'm going after him. I'm going to take him out. But God will supernaturally protect the people of Israel by giving them a place of refuge. This is described twice in Revelation. For 1,260 days, the woman will be given refuge. Now, let's think about this. The woman is given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. Those last few words there, time and times and half a time. A time is a year. Times is two years. Half a time is literally half a year. So two plus one in my math equals three. Half is three and a half. For three and a half years, tribulation is seven years long. We can all do the math on this, right? For half of the tribulation period, there'll be a place of refuge set up for God's people. Now, it's interesting because we have to remember Satan is limited. He is not like God. He is limited by where he can be at once. So when Satan is cast down to this earth, we can, we can understand here out of Revelation chapter 12 that Satan first takes his attack to Israel, to the nation, to the geography of Israel, not just to the Israelites, okay, because they're going to be around the, around the world, but he takes it specifically to the location of Israel. That's where he's going. And so at that moment, he's going to the place where most of them are, and he's going to try to scatter them. He's going to try to destroy them there in Israel. Now, the woman is fleeing. Israel is fleeing from the nation of Israel. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. All right, and we're going to look at this a little bit more in greater detail. But imagine the Israelites fleeing the nation of Israel because of what's coming down upon them. And as they're fleeing, imagine a flood of water pursuing them to wash them away. Now, I love irony in Scripture, and I love how Satan over and over again tries to use what God has used in the past. Satan's trying to do the same thing. If we go back in the book of Exodus, what did God use to protect his people from being swept away by Pharaoh's army? He used water. Pharaoh's army was destroyed by water, by the Red Sea coming in. And it makes me laugh just a little bit because here's Satan trying to do the same thing to God's people, using water to destroy them. But God being a little bit bigger, <laughs> it's like, Satan, is that all you got? Check this out. The earth came to the help of the woman. The earth opened his mouth and swallowed the river the dragon had poured from his mouth. So as you're watching this on the film, you're standing above it, you see the huge congregation running, fleeing. And then you see water being poured out and chasing them, pursuing them, and there's nowhere to go. And all of a sudden, the earth opens up and the water's gone. And you stand up in your chair and you cheer and you shout and you say, yeah, God's got this, doesn't he? That's what the people are going to be seeing. They're going to be seeing God's got this. Now, a little sidebar. Where are they fleeing to? Where are they going? Many biblical scholars see this place of refuge as Petra. It appears God supernaturally transports and then protects many Israelites during the final years of the tribulation within Petra or around the area of Petra. Matthew chapter 24, 15 through 16. Jesus says these words. When you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Halfway through the tribulation, the peace treaty will be broken. The Antichrist will, will desolate the temple. Daniel talks about this. It's going to happen. And Jesus says in Matthew 24, when you see the desolation of the temple occur, you who live in Judea, run. Flee to the mountains. Get out of there. This, I just killed it, didn't I? That was me, I think, Eric. Did you get it back for me? Not yet. He's coming. See, now this is what I do to myself. All right. Hey. Yes. Thank you, Eric. All right. So he's saying, I want you guys to flee. Where are they fleeing to? How do we know where the mountains are? Well, other prophets talk about this, give us some greater detail. In the King James Version, in the King James, and I like this, other versions, they kind of skirt around it. The King James calls it what it is, and I like this. Micah, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, 
all of thee, all of you, okay? So Jacob, Israel, all right? I will surely assemble Israel, all of you, Israelites. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as a sheep of Basra, as in the flock in the midst of their fold. They shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. The sheep of Basra, there's significance there because the sheep of Basra indicates a certain portion of land, which was south and east of Israel, mostly east of anywhere you are in Israel. But it was east and on the south end of Israel, okay? Basra is that area. And Micah says, I'm going to gather you, and I'm going to put you together as a sheep of Basra, as a flock in the midst of their fold. He's describing them as being a flock of sheep in a fold. That's where I'm going to put you, in this area of Basra. Now, Jeremiah says this, I have sworn by myself, declares the Lord, that Basra shall become a whore, a taunt, a waste, a curse, and all her cities shall be perpetual waste. And you say, well, that doesn't sound very good. He's going to go down there, and he's going to do this to the place where the Israelites are? This is exactly what's going to happen Because at the end of their time down there, the Israelites will end up, there's going to be a great battle north of there in the Battle of Armageddon when all the nations come together and fight one last time. It's not going to be around Petra per se, because what happens? God, again, protects them for his amount of time, and then God does what he does. And God brings events together to have a battle somewhere else. But what's he say here? I've heard a message from the Lord. An envoy has been sent among the nations. Gather yourselves together, come against her, and rise up for battle. This is a description of the Antichrist wanting to come up against Basra, the area of Basra, and destroy the Israelites. God himself will protect them. He will. God will protect them. And finally, the battle will shift to the Armageddon, the location of Armageddon, the Valley of Megiddo, which we're going to talk about in a few weeks. But for now, there's this place in Petra where they are going to be secure, this area of Basra where they're going to be secure. Now, some of you think, well, what's the big deal? How do we know what that looks like? Well, the top arrow there is Jerusalem. The bottom arrow there is where Petra is, okay? So you've got Jerusalem up there. It's about 100 miles in between them. So they're going to be fleeing to this area. How many of you guys enjoy Indiana Jones movies? Anybody here? I'm not going to throw you, okay? Anybody here? We're all Christians, right? Okay, Indiana Jones, all right? How many of you guys recognize this? That's Petra. That's a picture of Petra. It's a real place. It's not just a movie prop. It's a real place. This is Petra. It's a narrow valley leading into Petra, which back in the days when it was just bow and arrow and sword, just a few men could defend this valley. And they built by hand, they hand carved this great cathedral into the walls of Petra. This is what Petra is. And again, most of us believe that this is where God is going to send the Israelites during his final three and a half years, 1260 days, she's going to be nourished, where God will supernaturally take care of them within this land, within this city, within these walls of Petra. A few scholars, very few, all right, they see the reference of the great eagle as a reference to the United States and believe we'll be offering assistance to Israel during this time. Personally, I don't buy it, all right? But they see that. They talk about how on the wings of the great eagle, they will be transported to Petra. And so they see that's the United States giving them assistance and flying them down there and dropping them off in Petra. Well, if you're going to fly them down there, how, how is it the flood of water is going to make a difference? Because the flood of water is not going to wash the plane out of the sky, and that's what Satan uses to wash them away. I don't know what it means. But here, again, I'm going to say this, all right? God chose the nation of Israel to be his people, and yet he allowed them to be a fallen, a collapsed nation for over 2,000 years. Why would he allow us as a nation to not collapse? What's so special about us? I'm going to contend to you again that I do not believe the U.S. will be a force during the end times. We will not be a nation of power. We will be part of a collaboration of nations, I believe that. But on its own, I do not believe we will be an independent world power during this time. So again, I don't think, so based on, on that and other things, I think you're stretching to say the great eagle because, hey, that's our symbol, that's our bird, right? That's us, we're the eagle. I don't see it. I'm just letting you know what others think, all right? Somebody says, well, yeah, the United States is going to be there because the great eagle, and that's who we are. Well, I can't go there. Personal opinion, letting you know it's my opinion, and maybe you're disagreeing, and that's fine, you can disagree. I'm just saying what other people think, and I can't go there, all right? Now, back to Satan. After this happens, Satan begins an all-out war with the rest of God's people scattered around the globe. Because remember, Satan's not limited in geography. He is limited in geography. He cannot be everywhere at once. So when he attacks God's people there, he's attacking that region. And the people in that region are fleeing. 
What about the people outside of that region? Because there are many, many, many outside of that region. So now we're getting toward the end of the film. We've seen the water come down. We've seen the earth swallowed up. We've seen the enemies of Satan escape into the walled city. And we see them protected by God. And we think, man, it's the end. This is it. The problem is it's not the end. We're just getting ready for the, well, from the sitcom, you're getting ready to be, to be continued. You're getting ready to see that across the screen. The dragon became furious with the woman, went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. And the words to be continued came across the screen. Picture, if you would, on the beach, on the sandy ocean, for those of you who've been down there, just picture the lone silhouette looking across the ocean. This is what John sees in his vision. He sees Satan standing on the sea, looking out. And Revelation chapter 13 picks up the very next scene that happens, which will be in two weeks. It gets intense. We think it's bad now, it's only going to get worse. Satan is not going to go down without a fight. Part one has ended well. Part two will also end well, but it's going to be bad in the middle. So we've met the good, which is the two witnesses, Israel, the woman. We've met the bad, which is Satan. In two weeks, we're going to see two characters that emerge from that sea as Satan stands there on the shore, who are shown for who they really are, and that is the Antichrist, that is the false prophet. In two weeks, we're going to meet these men, these people that Satan brings in to help him out. They're already, the the Antichrist is already there. He's already settled a peace treaty. By the way, many of you guys have wondered, is this peace treaty that happened this week? Is this a sign of the end times? Does this mean President Trump's the Antichrist, right? You can read all sorts of stuff because he was the one that facilitated this. The answer to that question in short is no. Because the peace treaty the Antichrist does, it's a peace treaty that's all-encompassing. It's not just one or two nations. It's not just three or four nations. It's all nations surrounding Israel will have this peace treaty. That has not yet happened. We've had smaller peace treaties like this happen before, back in 94, if you look at it. There's been smaller peace treaties that happened. Does not mean the person who did that was the Antichrist. All right? So I'm just clearing your mind on this. But there will someday be a peace treaty signed with Israel. There will be all nations signing this. That will be facilitated by the man who will emerge as the Antichrist. And that happens, if you'll begin aware of it, when Satan is defeated there in heaven, thrown down, defeated as he tries to pursue the Israelites, and then he looks out in the ocean and he brings forth reinforcements. And it's incredible what we're going to read there. Now, guys, I want you to understand this. Satan right now is a real enemy. He's the one that we're really fighting against. It's not, it's not the situation of the world. It's not all these things. It's Satan we're fighting against. Ephesians chapter 6 says it this way. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This is who we're fighting against. This is it. We are in St. Paul, Nebraska, a town of about 2,300 people, right? We have a very small percentage of them attending this church. About, I don't know, 4% today, maybe, in this church, okay? That's a lot of people outside of this church. Now, there are other churches here in town, and so there's other people going there. But let's say, let's, just for the benefit of the doubt, let's say 10% of St. Paul is in church today, 10%. That's 90% of our town that we have not reached, 90% of our town that we need to reach, and we sit there and we think, well, we got all this stuff going on and, there, and life is happening. The reality is this, is that we're fighting against Satan for the other 90%. What are we going to do? You hear about churches, and I'm going to get on a soapbox here for just a minute. You hear about churches going on retreats. Why are we retreating? Can I ask that question? Why do we retreat? You, you rarely find churches that are even attacking that need to retreat, Right? We forget what's coming. Revelation chapter 12 should inspire us, should encourage us. It should give us a battle cry to say, God, I need to keep my neighbors out of this. I need to keep my friends out of this. It's going to be like that storm in Iowa this last week where one minute you're putting animals in the barn, next minute you got sheet metal flying everywhere. It's going to be boom. It's going to happen. And we're just sitting here thinking, well, it's time for another regroup. It's time for another retreat when we're not doing anything to retreat from. And I know we in St. Paul, we, we here at Grace, we want to make mature followers of Jesus Christ. And, and we, we are doing that, but I know we can do it even more. We have an opportunity here. We have something, a window that's open, and I don't know how long it's going to be open for us to do what God has called us to be. 
called us to do, which in Matthew chapter 28, he says, go, make disciples. Guys, you, everyone in this room knows somebody. Everyone in this room knows somebody who needs Jesus. Everyone in this room knows somebody who needs to hear the gospel. Everyone does. Whether you admit it or not, you know that. Are you attacking? Are you doing it? It's so easy to sit there in our chairs and be passive, and I am guilty of it as well, and I recognize this. But guys, if we're going to be a church and in five years, by the end of 2027, by the end of 2027, it's seven years, we want to reach 10% of Howard County. That's 600 people. We're going to need people to get up and, and attack. We're going to need us to grab our flag and go into battle saying we're going to take the hill. That's what we need. We're going to need men. Guys in this church, we're going to need you to rise up first. We need men to say, we're going to do this. You say, well, I don't feel equipped for this. September chapter 13, September chapter 13, September 13. On September 13, we've got somebody coming to our church. He's going to help equip us for this. He's coming. I want you to mark it in your calendar. I want you to be here September 13, as there's going to be a training here at Grace on how we can attack, how we can go forward with the gospel with confidence, knowing what that means. It'll be September 13. We want to equip you. But guys, we've got something coming. We've got a window. Because our battle isn't, isn't against our neighbors. Our battle is against Satan who's influencing our neighbors. We've got to understand that out of love, we need to go get them. Are we willing to go get them? Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He's out there. He's doing his best to discourage us. He's keeping us tangled up in life, and every single one of us has had life situations happen. And let me tell you, they're going to continue happening. We're going to get caught up. We're going to get distracted in these little things, these temporal things, which really aren't so little when you sit and think about it. Or are we going to forget what God's called us to do because it happens so quickly? Be sober-minded. Be watchful your adversary. That's who we're fighting here. Your adversary, the devil. He said, well, I can't fight against the devil. What am I going to do with that? Well, 1 John 4.4. 4. I love 1 John 4.4. 4. When we tell kids about the boogeyman, right? I heard stories about the boogeyman growing up. Boogeyman's your closet. My brother's always trying to scare me. Bigger cousins, right? Here's the thing. The boogeyman's not so scary when dad's sleeping next to you, right? You get scared and you go into dad's room and you sleep on the floor he has a closet too. He has a closet bigger than my closet, but I was never scared sleeping next to dad on the floor there, right? 1 John 4, 4. Little children from God have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. I got somebody sleeping right next to me. I got somebody there right next to me who said, you know what? The devil's roaring around, prowling around, but we got this. So then I think, Pastor, I can't do this. I've never done this before. This is a stretch for me. I don't even know what to do. And God's like, dude, I got this. Are you willing to try? Are you willing to go? We have a window. Are we going to take it? God, we read Revelation chapter 12, and frankly, as I see the, the, the story play out there, it's fascinating to see this. And Lord, it's also incredible to see your power exhibited how you yourself, you, walk, you, t you swallow up the waters. How you yourself, you send a supernatural protection on the people and they're nourished there for 1,260 days. Even though the, the Antichrist and all his forces are going to come against them and try to destroy them, you protect them and you provide for them. God, I thank you for that. Right now, God, we are in the middle of this battle and we are fighting. And Lord, I pray that we would fight. That we would not be a church known for great retreats, but that we would be a church known for great charges. Lord, I pray for this. Help us as we trust in you. Help us as we read your word, God. I pray you give us the strength and the energy to do this well. Lord, may we cry out as we read your word. May we cry out, God, your word is what we believe. And this is what we trust in. We praise you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Please rise. I believe. 
so that you might believe that Jesus is a Christ, the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says this, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. I believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life, and because of that I believe I have the Holy Spirit within me, and you who have believed have the same within you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And not just today, but for the rest of our lives, may we live that truth out as we charge. Not retreat, but as we charge for the sake of the gospel. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for worship. I thank you that we can be in your presence today. And Father, I thank you that you have guaranteed your presence within us. Thanks, God. We just honor you and praise you for it. Lord, may what we do bring you glory in all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Don't forget, potluck, just a few minutes. Stick around if you can. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Thanks for coming today.